you know there's such a thing as too late? There's such a thing as too late. And that thought haunts me. It haunts me that maybe if I was a little bolder or, or, a, little, or a little more courageous that maybe more people would hear if I wasn't so obsessed or, or, or concerned about my safety or, or what people might say or do. That's why when I come here to preach, I'm, I, I don't want to hold anything back because I want to walk off the stage of life whenever that may come. I want to walk off and be able to say with a clear conscience, Lord, I gave it my best. I did my best to preach truth to people, whether, whether they celebrated it or whether they rejected it. Amen. So uh, let's stand for the reading of God's word. Uh, we have two more parts uh, to this week and next week I'll be finishing this series and um, and so again this is a very important series and I believe God has been speaking so um, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 to 20 let's read it out loud together there's something about the reading of God's word faith cometh by hearing it doesn't say faith cometh by reading it's it's good to read the Bible but it's even better to speak it because then you're hearing it. Amen. So finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, <coughs> having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. You know the Bible, you may be seated. The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we are ambassadors of Christ. And so we've had a, an ambassador of Israel here with us. And I think that was our, probably our fifth ambassador, if my, if my memory serves me correctly. Either, my four, either our fourth or fifth time having a different ambassador of Israel in this church. And, and, and again, I think that's a, a tremendous um, a blessing. But you know, the Bible says we're ambassadors of Christ. And, and Paul said, I'm an ambassador in chains. And so we're representatives of Christ, our Lord and Savior. And I, I recently reread an old book one that I bought uh, 30 years ago called The Overcoming Life by D.L. Moody, uh, D.L. Moody, uh, 1837 to 1899. And um, uh, if, if Breed is there, uh, just, just give us a wave, Breed, Breed and Kay. Just give her, give, that's, that's Breed there. She, um, she, she's a wonderful woman of God, and for many years she had a bookshop uh, as part of a church in the city. And uh, many of those books that I read as a young man 30 years ago changed my life. And, um, and so... Uh, but I started rereading that book again. Uh, you know, D.L. Moody was an amazing man of God. He was an American evangelist. And in his life, he spoke to over 100 million people. Um, bear in mind, in 1850, the world population was only 1.2 billion. Um, in 1900, the year after he died, it was 1.6 billion. And so he preached to somewhere between 6 and 8% of the world population at the time without cars, without planes, without internet, without TV broadcast, and even without amplification. And um, I find it striking that even though the book was written uh, about 150 years ago, that in it he addresses the reality of spiritual warfare and the battles that we face as believers. And notwithstanding the battles we face, our call to fight and win. I mean, to be honest, the book could have been written uh, last week because the reality is this. We're facing the same enemies the church has always faced. It's like the saying, 
<coughs> excuse me, they haven't gone away, you know. Um, you know, the demons and the devils and uh, uh, principalities and powers that Christ encountered and that he cast out of people and that uh, uh, afterwards the demons that the early church faced in the book of Acts, they haven't ceased to exist or to stop their work of robbing, killing, deceiving, and destroying precious people made in God's image. And, um, and if they have, where have they gone? Well, Hebrews 13 and 5 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I take great heart from that to, to remind myself that we serve the same Jesus with the same power, the same mercy, the same glory. But in a way, um, not in the same way or to the same level, but in a way that so is the devil. I mean, he is the same. Uh, he is consistent, if nothing else. And we therefore have to be on our guard because this isn't a game. It's a battle. And the devil is persistent and playing to win. Are you? 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty true God for the pulling down of strongholds. We've been talking about victory in spiritual warfare because ultimately if you're into sport and you miss a match, uh, the only question you really have uh, when, uh, afterwards is, who won? Uh, and, and in the same way, I think, we make the mistake of thinking that once you get saved, the battle is over, when in reality, it has only begun. That's why 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12 says, fight the good fight of faith. Because sometimes the sun is on your face, the wind's at your back, and all is good and easy. And at other times, you have to grit your teeth, dig in, and fight. That's why Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 14. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. You see, we are called to victory. But in order to win, we need to listen and learn and grow. And so it's my sincere hope that through this series, um, it has helped in some way for you to identify the plans and the agendas of Satan in your life or your family or your world. I mean, personally, on a personal level, I've seen a lot of pushback spiritually since I started this series. I've lost track of the, the number of, you know, secular articles that have been written and, um, you know, and the lies that have been told and the accusations that have been made and the amount of times people have shared my preaching, um, uh, you know, and... Uh, I'm okay with people sharing my preaching. I, if, if I wasn't, I wouldn't have it out on YouTube. And, and so um, what I say may not be politically correct, but it's spoken in love. I, I know people might necessarily see that or understand that, but it is. It's spoken in love because uh, the Bible says speaking truth in love. And so um, anyway, I... I I was under no illusions regarding the pushback. Maybe the scale of it was a little surprising. But uh, it is expected because Satan doesn't like his secrets being revealed, his schemes being questioned, or his idols being confronted. And so, notwithstanding all of that, I've been so blessed every week to see people being saved and being set free. And uh, I give God the glory because I live for those moments. I really do. I live for those moments when people respond and give their lives to Jesus Christ because this is our calling, preaching both repentance and relationship with God. And one precedes the other because there are parts of the church that are no longer preaching the gospel because they have got rid of repentance and so they only just talk about relationship. But there is no relationship with God without repentance. And... Um, yeah, there can be no, there can be no revival until there's been repentance. Acts twenty six and twenty. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. And so the end times church. We'll have, we'll have a deep sense of, of reverence and a new revelation of the holiness of God. Um, Charles G. Finney said this. Charles G. Finney was a great American revivalist. And he said, if the presence of God is in the church, the church will draw the world in. If the presence of God is not in the church, the world will draw the church out. 
And so the fact that churches have lost so many young people is an indictment of the fact that we have not valued the presence of God, that we have not been on our faces and on our knees crying out to God for our generation. Luke chapter 24 and verse 36. Here Jesus is talking before um, he ascends in glory. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened as well as they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet that is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe for joy and marveled and said to him, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. And he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So again, as I'm talking about spiritual warfare and the, re- and, and the reality behind the, the spiritual reality behind the physical reality, we can see why Satan hates the Jewish people. Because again, the apostles, the prophets, Christ came through them. And this is why no matter where they have gone, they have been persecuted. And, and you know, no matter how enlightened each age thinks it is, we see that hatred rising up. And this is why as the church, we have to be discerning and realize what we're dealing with. We're dealing with spiritual realities. These are not natural reasons. They're not natural causes. It is spiritual and it is demonic. And it is terribly sad to see so many parts of the church being given over to this ideology that, that, that is standing actively and, and hating the Jewish people. And so, again, Jesus said all that was written in the prophets, prophets and Moses had to be um, fulfilled concerning me. So remember, whether it's the Old or New Testament, there's one message, and it's Jesus. In the Old Testament, it was speaking of Jesus. It might have been in types and shadows, but you can see Jesus all through this book. And it, it, he carried on, and... Um, And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And I I pray that for every one of you here today, that God would open your understanding, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know the hope to which you've been called. You know, that you're not just going to read the Bible on a superficial level, but, but you know, that truth is going to go beyond your head and enter into your heart. Because it's only when it enters your heart that it changes you. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It's, It's only the truth that you know deep in your heart that will really change you. And so, uh, When he had said this to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And, verse 47, very key, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you're witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father um, upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. What did Jesus say? That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. What did he say he wanted to be preached? Repentance and remission of sins. I want to ask the question today. Have we as the church been faithful to this calling? And more importantly, going forward, will we remain faithful to that calling? Particularly in a generation... That is determined to call good evil and, good, and, and evil good. Uh, Isaiah 5 and verse 20. God says, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Who put bitter, for, uh, sweet for bitter and, and bitter for sweet. Who put light for darkness and darkness. For, uh, I got it completely wrong. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And so, again, will we be faithful? In the midst of a generation that is determined to label the preaching of eternal truth as hate speech. We see Jesus was a friend of sinners. But he was a friend of sinners, not because he endorsed their sin, but because he called them to repentance. I think it's important to understand that. But as a society, we have hardened our hearts against God, goodness, and eternal truth. As a society, we have offered our unborn to Malik, and now we are giving our children over to being sexualized and groomed by the left. And yet, many of our religious leaders maintain a polite silence. How can they do that? 
I agree with my friend, Pastor Tunde. Future generations will curse us if we remain silent in the face of this demonic agenda, particularly the sexualization and indoctrination of our children. And it is demonic, and we need to quit pretending that it isn't. I mean, over the last few weeks, I've seen some media outlets desperately reaching to try and make the argument for teaching this perverse content to our children as if it's somehow virtuous and safe. It's not. As a father and as a pastor, I've given warning, and I know I've obeyed God in doing so, and my conscience is clear, and I'm not backing down or apologizing for anything I've said. I know I have done the right thing. Ezekiel 33, 7 and 9. So you, son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man will die in his iniquities, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you've delivered your soul. And you have the, almost a parallel verse in uh, Ezekiel chapter 3 saying much the same thing. And so there is a place for warning. Uh, Esther chapter 4 and verse 10. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out his golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai told him to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more, any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And so we see this, this parallel, generation after generation, whether it's to true Haman uh, seeking to wipe out the Jews, or, or Pharaoh looking to do the same time at the time of Moses, or, or, or Herod uh, doing it at the birth of Christ, or even others like, like Hitler and, and, and these others who, who sought to, to persecute and, and wipe out the Jews. Why is there this consistent theme? I believe it's because God's call is upon the Jewish people. Amen. And so it doesn't matter where they're at. You might say, well, many of them are atheists. It doesn't matter. God's call is upon them. And he has a plan for the nation of Israel. And the Bible says that he will one day return and his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And the Bible prophesies that he will return to the nation of Israel. And, and, and so this is again why I, I stand with them. But I think it's important to understand that the Bible says here that surely you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And so I find it ironic that people who in many instances deny the reality of God, heaven, hell, angels, or demons, and even right or wrong, take such offense when I say that there is demonic influence behind much of what our society chooses to honor and celebrate and actively promote. What we call virtue, God calls vice. What we call good, God calls sin. I know that's an old-fashioned word, and it may seem archaic to some, but the reality is God, as God, is the one who reserves the right to decide what is right or wrong. And so if we celebrate what God condemns, even if because we're afraid or intimidated, we have made ourselves enemies of God, enemies of the cross, and we are guilty of loving the world and its ways. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17 Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk and have us for a pattern. But many walk of whom I've told you beforehand, even now weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Do you know the cross of Christ? There is a cost to the call. And, and the cross speaks of the call. The cross speaks of suffering. It doesn't speak of comfort. And yet so many times it seems like preaching is focused on making everybody comfortable. And, and yet Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. And so let me, let me say this. In the days that are to come, there may be a price for following Christ and for remaining faithful to his word. 
I, I don't want to be described as an enemy of the cross. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you a citizen of heaven? If you're not, we're going to give you an opportunity at the end of this message. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world... Love for the Father is not in them, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. There is a sifting going on in the body of Christ. And, and that sifting is happening between those who truly love God and those who love the world. This is the day to choose your side. To choose to serve the Lord. Like Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So how can our generation repent if we refuse to call them to repentance? Because heaven rejoices over these moments when people respond and surrender their lives to Christ. But what does heaven rejoice over exactly? I mean, does heaven rejoice over our tears? No. Even though the Bible says that, I think it was Charles Spurgeon referred to tears as liquid prayers. You know, when you're in hospital and praying with somebody who's dying, and you read the Bible, it's completely different to many times reading it in church. I, I've seen men weep as you read the scriptures to them in their final moments. Over and over again. They, they don't ask about their Instagram account. They don't ask about Facebook. They don't ask about, you know, uh, their worldly wealth. When a person is dying, they, they, they just have a different focus. And, you know, I've had the advantage of being in that place many times, of, of being with somebody in their, their final hours. And so it gives you a perspective about what's important. That's why I'm not on Netflix all week, or I'm not wasting all my time on social media, as some of you might be. Because I, I recognize this ends in eternity. And therefore, I want to live for something that is eternal. I want to live for something that, that goes beyond the, the transient, superficial things of this world. And that's why I'm really not too upset about what people might say or think about me. Because ultimately, I know all that matters is what he says. Are you going to live like that? You know, God values our tears. Psalm 56 and 8 tells us, you keep track of my sorrows. You've collected all my tears in your bottle. You've recorded each one in your book. Do you know that God sees and values our tears, but it's not our tears ultimately that heaven rejoices. What does heaven rejoice over? Over one sinner who repents. Luke chapter 15. And the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to see him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So I spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. So what woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and go carefully and search carefully till she finds it. When she finds it, she, brings her, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of God over one sinner who repents. What does heaven rejoice over? Jesus said, over a sinner who repents. I'm not being pompous or arrogant, but I believe that through this series, God has been uh, warning not only this nation, but also the church. Because if we as ministers... And, and religious leaders muddy the waters by downplaying God's holiness and other rejection and condemnation 
of sin and refuse to call sin what it is because it has become normalized or celebrated or, or because criticism of it is politically incorrect or even classified as hate speech, how can people truly recognize their sin or actually repent? Let me, and let me be perfectly clear. It's not just the immoral who go to hell. The moral go there too. And to be honest, too many times as the church, we've addressed the openly immoral, and yet we're silence, silent in the face of the self-righteous whom Jesus condemned because morality or our good works or religiosity cannot save you. Only the grace of God can. Only the grace of God can save you. I had a very vivid dream during the week where I was talking to a, a very religious woman. It, it, you know, it seemed like a very good moral person, but she died. And, and I remember her screaming as she died because she was going to hell because she was trusting in her righteousness. If you die trusting in your righteousness, you will go to hell. And so this is why the Bible calls us to repent. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. By, by grace you've been saved through faith. Uh, this not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works. This anyone should boast. You see, many sincere religious people go to hell because they're trusting in their righteousness. Surely the parable of the, the, the Pharisee and the publican is an example. Luke chapter 18, verse um, 9 to 14. And he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as... Lift his, raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He humbles himself, he who humbles himself will be exalted. You see, the Pharisee was praying because he was sincere, but he was sincerely deceived. You know, Luke chapter 13, Jesus warned this generation there were present some who uh, that season who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such thing? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Are those 18 on whom the tower in Salom fell... Do you think they were worse sinners than all the other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus was saying, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, it's a bit like I remember years ago back in the 80s seeing an advertisement from uh, America. All things crazy come from there, but uh, I love America. But it was, uh, it was a big poster on the side of a funeral home. And uh, on the funeral home, it, it simply said, which brand do you smoke? <laughs> And it was, you know, just making the link between their business and, you know, smoke. Anyway, I'm just saying it doesn't matter what the particular sin is that a person engages. And if you refuse to repent, Jesus said you're going to end up in the same place. Amen? And so Jesus warned his generation, repent of your sin or you will go to hell. Because let me say this, all true preaching brings you to a place of repentance. And this is why, again... There will be times when you come to church, you're going to feel uncomfortable. You're going to squirm in your seat. You're going to come under conviction. That's because the Holy Spirit is dealing with you supernaturally through a message that goes out to many people, and yet God makes it individual to you. Amen? And, and again, this is why a minister must fearlessly confront sin and call it what it is. You don't need therapy. You need to repent. Satan is pushing this agenda through the Western world by weaponizing the legal system against the faithful preaching of the gospel. And that's why we're seeing hate speech bills, you know, all throughout the Western world. And it's an agenda because it's like the decree that was given in the book of Daniel, where you were to fall and worship the golden idol that had been set up. And later on, um, when you were forbidden to pray to any god for 30 days except to the king. It was like Satan saying to the people of God, go ahead, I dare you. Well, what did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do? 
They stood when everybody else bowed down. What did Daniel do? He prayed, but with the windows open. And that's the way I want to live my life. I want to live my life with the windows open. Let people say what they, they say. Let people do what they do. I'm not going to cower and hide in the shadows, fearful of what people might do. Daniel prayed with the windows open in absolute defiance of what was a tyrannical law. And there is such a thing as bad law. All Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to do was grovel along with everybody else. All Daniel had to do was shut the window, lock the door, and pray in whispers. Go through the motions. Pretend you believe the lie. Pretend you support the cause. I mean, for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it was only for a moment. For Daniel, it was only for a month. What's the big deal, pastor? It's just pride month. What's the problem? Because I do not support, nor will I pretend to support, what God condemns. God hates the sin. He loves the sinner. Luke 24, 47, preaching repentance and remission. This is Jesus talking. He didn't say preach your best life now or or preach how to to do this and how to have that and how to get your life together and how to be a better person. No, you need to repent. That is part and parcel of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, there is no remission where there is no repentance. We see the story of the prodigal son. He's, he's, you know, in filth. He's in sin. He's, he's in, in such a dark place. He's hungry. And it says when he came to himself, he said, how, how many of my father's servants eat more than enough? And here I am starving. And he said, I will return to my father's house. And I will say, Father, I've sinned. Do you know what that was? Repentance. True change didn't come until he expressed true repentance. And true repentance does not happen in the absence of true preaching. I tremble, therefore, when I consider the holy responsibility that we as ministers have been given. To be honest, I've started to question a lot of preaching and a lot of preachers. I'm not saying it's unbiblical. I'm just saying it's unbalanced. We have to give a balanced message. And and if the world is changing, let's remind ourselves that God says in the book of Malachi, I the Lord do not change. So we have to choose. Who do we go with? Do we go with the world or do we go with God? Luke chapter 16 verse 27. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Understand, heaven is real, hell is real. Heaven is a place of endless happiness, hell is a place of endless torment. He said, I'm tormented in this flame. And he said to them, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. And he said to him, no. That's really what our generation has done. Our generation has looked at the law of God and said, no. We're going to rewrite this because we are now enlightened. We know better. And much of the church has remained silent in the face of that. No. Can you imagine that even in hell, This man was still saying no. He said no to God in life. And he was still saying no to him in death. And that spirit of rebellion has taken hold of our generation. The rejection of God. The rejection of moral absolutes. The rejection of even the divine order whereby God made us male and female. I know you might feel like I'm relentless in talking about this, but the reality is the agenda to push it on our children is relentless. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. This is the tragedy. This man discovered the answer to life 
in death. He recognized in that moment the answer. He recognized the answer to life only in death. He discovered the answer too late. What was the answer? Repent and believe in Jesus. Thomas Hobbes, 1588 to 1679. Hell is truth seen too late. Do you know there's such a thing as too late? There's such a thing as too late. And that thought haunts me. It haunts me that maybe if I was a little bolder or, or, a, little, or a little more courageous that maybe more people would hear if I wasn't so obsessed or, or, or concerned about my safety or, or what people might say or do. That's why when I come here to preach, I'm, I, I don't want to hold anything back because I want to walk off the stage of life whenever that may come. I want to walk off and be able to say with a clear conscience, Lord, I gave it my best. I did my best to preach truth to people, whether, whether they celebrated it or whether they rejected it. He discovered, he said, if, if he goes to them, they will repent. But he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded. The one rise from the dead. The reality is there are no atheists in hell. They all know God, Satan, heaven, and hell are real, but it's too late. So please tell me again about why I'm, I'm too serious when I preach. Pastor, why don't you tell more jokes? Well, I, I've kind of come to the place where it, 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 I, I, I tremble at the responsibility that God gives you to, to proclaim the message clear so that nobody will misunderstand. Luke 17, verse 1 to 4. Then he said to the disciples, it's impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a, uh, <clears throat> if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. So here I believe there's a, a biblical principle whereby we love everybody, but you know what? Some people you've got to keep it at arm's length. There's some toxic people, some toxic relationships. You need to protect yourself. You can forgive them, but you can love them from a distance. But the Bible says here, if they repent, forgive them. Well, I believe we're meant to, rep to, to forgive everybody. But I, I do think there's a principle here that, that the Bible is talking about how earthly forgiveness is, is, is predicated on repentance. And if earthly forgiveness is predicated on repentance, how much more is heavenly forgiveness? Amen. And so, the Bible says that in the story of the prodigal son, and they began to be merry. I love that verse. When the son came home and he was clothed by the father and they took the rags off him and put shoes in his feet. Yeah, you know, they put a, a robe of righteousness. They put a ring in his, his, his hand and they killed the fatted calf. And the Bible says they began to be merry. You see, we can only experience real joy after real repentance. The son had no joy when he was out in the world. And that's the way you are as a Christian. You will have no joy if you're leading a double life. If you're wanting on Sunday and something else on Monday. I'm sorry. You will have no joy. You will have no peace. You will have no true happiness. You know, and again, it came back to this where the, the elder brother, which again is symbolic of somebody that's got religion coming out their ears. It's interesting, both sons were far away from their father. One through sin and rebellion, the other through religiosity and legalism. And it says, he said to him, son, you're always with me and all I have is yours. Say that, all that he has is mine. Come on, all that he has is yours, whatever you might need. It was right that we should make Mary and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. I believe it was this verse that inspired John Newton to write the hymn, Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but now I was found. I was blind, but now I see. Because here these very words are contained. He says, your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. 
Hosea 10 verse 12, sow to yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord. Do you know before the farmer sows the seed, he has to drive the plow through that hard ground. And that's what repentance is, is when God deals with our heart about things, unforgiveness or secret sin or bad attitudes or rebellion or whatever else. God is, is breaking up. That's why Joel 2 says, rend your hearts and not your garments. You see, repentance precedes revival. And proclaiming God's word brings conviction of sin. Charles G. Finney again. Revival is a renewed conviction of sin and repentance followed by an intense desire to live in obedience to God. It's giving up one's will to God in deep humility. Do you have a deep desire to live for God? You see, we've been looking at the weapons of our warfare, and last week we started looking at the first weapon of our warfare, the Bible. If you could give me 10 minutes, I'll, I'll just go through uh, what I wanted to say last, the last time I was speaking. John chapter 14 and verse 23. Jesus answered and said to them, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. It's interesting, he didn't say, if anyone loves me, he'll get a tattoo of Jesus on his chest or have a WWJD bracelet or go around talking about the Lord all the time. That, that's fine if you want to do that, but the Lord simplified it. He said, if you love me, keep my word. If you love Jesus, keep his word. Uh, Revelation 19, 13, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. You see, Christ and his word are one. Just as Christ and his church are one, Christ and his word are one. The Bible says the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us in John chapter 1. Christ and his word are one. You only love Christ to the degree you love his word. You only obey Christ to the degree you obey his word. You only honor Christ to the degree that you honor his word. Because Christ and his word are one. That's why the Bible says preach the word in 2 Timothy 4.2. You see, all true preaching brings us to a place of repentance. Luke chapter 11 and verse 32. I know I'm sharing a lot of verses, but you can watch it back on the YouTube. And it says, the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. What did the preaching of, of, of Jonah bring to the people of Nineveh? Brought repentance. And Jesus said, I'm much greater than Jonah. And therefore, the words of Christ must bring us to a place of repentance too. And let me say this. This is something where we need to come to regularly. Because all of us tend to grow lax or allow things into our lives that are not pleasing to God. But let me say this. How can people repent if we're afraid to proclaim Bible truth and boldly call sin what it is? John 8, 32, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You see, first, truth sets you free, and then truth makes you free. Free societies have always had a biblical foundation, always. That's why you go to nations where they haven't had the Bible, they don't have the same freedom. Now, again, unfortunately, Many of our nations have taken that freedom that came from the Bible and we have just used it for licentiousness and perversion and ungodliness and, and, and that's another issue. But again, if you want to look at nations that have never had the Bible, they don't have the same freedom that you have today. And that's why we're seeing increasingly repressive societies forming. When the WEF say, you will own nothing and be happy, does that sound like a free existence to you? Where you own nothing? Where you're just a glorified serf? Doing what your masters tell you? Just because they say it with a smiling face doesn't mean that it's not a threat. You see, we have to fight to maintain our freedom. And this is why we have a duty to proclaim the gospel. Matthew 24, 14. This gospel, Jesus lists all the signs of the times in the preceding 13 verses. He talks about deception and destruction, division, wars, uh, all of these things that we're seeing on, uh, around us right now. But he, he brings it back 
In verse 14 it says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the nations, and then the end will come. You see, we have a, a part to play in these end days, and our part is to preach the gospel. And it is a gospel that calls you to repentance. You see, light drives out darkness and truth exposes lies. I believe in the absolute authority of Scripture. It's not personal, therefore. If you're an adulterer, a fornicator, a liar, a thief, a gambler, a murderer, the gospel is the same for all, and it is repent. And repent simply means to turn, turn from your sin. And yet, if you choose to defy God and harden your heart, you will suffer the eternal consequences. Acts 17 and 30, truly these times of repent of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. Why? Because God knows the eternal consequences of what face a person if they refuse to repent. You can justify your sin all you want. You can everybody else around justify your sin, but ultimately you will stand alone before God. And this is why God calls us to repent while there's still time. My, my precious African brothers and sisters, just, just wave your hand. If you're from Africa, come on, let me see you. That's beautiful. You know, I thank God that the gospel went to Africa. And when you, when you study the lives of many of these men and women that went, I mean, many of them didn't last that long, but they went with the gospel. But don't be greedy. It's not just for you. The gospel is for those from South America and Central America and North America, for those from Asia and those from, from uh, the Middle East and, and those from Eastern Europe and Western Europe and Ireland. The gospel is for everyone. Amen? And the very first thing the gospel tells us without preference and without reference to color, culture, or creed is to repent. The gospel tells us that we are wrong and God is right. You see, the Bible tells us to look and live. John 3, 14, Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And I'm not going to go there, but Numbers 21 talks about how the people complained and the serpents came in and were biting them. And, and it says, Moses prayed for the people and God told Moses, put a serpent, a brass serpent, put it on a pole, and anyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, will live. And that is the gospel message, which is look and live. But, but to look, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. But in order to look unto Jesus, we have to look away from Satan and his lies. John 8, 44 says, Satan is a liar and the father of lies. And so, again, we must look to Jesus Christ. You see, Satan lies. That's what he does. He's a liar and the father of lies and the father of liars. And this is why we must determine to walk in the truth. And this explains why media, politics, business, law, education, art, and ironically, even religion are so important to him because they can propagate and broadcast his message or his lies. And in many instances, enshrine his lies in law. You see, state approval may give certain authority or respectability to his lies, but they're still lies. The devil knows that, but they serve his purposes if people believe them. Let me say this. It's a lie that a man can become a woman. It's a lie. And yet many in our generation believe it. You see, lies take people that God loves to an eternal hell. That's why when you see a Protestant minister wearing a, a, a rainbow Planned Parenthood scarf, you can know they're, they're telling a lie. And they're selling a lie because God does not and will not endorse the taking of innocent human life, nor will he bless sexual immorality. Lies serve his purpose as well because the same way as turning a signpost will take people on the wrong path. And this is why Satan fights the Bible. Why? Because it is the truth. Let me read this quote. If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, People will eventually come to believe it. The lie can be maintained only for as long, for such time as the state can shield the people from the political, economic, and or military consequences of the lie. 
It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent. For truth is the mortal enemy of the lie, and thus by extension, the lie is the, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. Who said that? Joseph Goebbels during the uh, Third Reich. Truth is the greatest enemy of the state. You see, history demonstrates that any time earthly governments codify lies and law, there will be consequences for the church. I know there's many Romanian brothers and sisters here who maybe you're too young to have been in it, but you remember the stories of how believers were terribly persecuted um, under Ceausescu's reign and under the reign of uh, the, the Soviets under uh, communism. And uh, the reason why the church was persecuted is because as believers, we have a different standard that we hold to. And therefore, we cannot bow before uh, earthly dictators. We cannot bow before, you know, kings and, and, and tyrants and, and potentates who demand that we subvert our faith to whatever ideology they're pushing. The same with the Polish and many others in Eastern Europe. There was a great price that was paid uh, by believers, and you need to study that because Anytime earthly governments codify lies and law, there would be consequences for the church because we are a people who are called to walk in truth no matter what. No turning back is more than simply a nice anthem. It is a divine command. James 3 and verse 1, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers knowing that we teach will receive a stricter judgment. And therefore, I agree, it's a tremendous responsibility to teach the word of God and to influence others because there are eternal ramifications to what people believe and the reality is this false teachers come in many forms this is why we need to be awake and we need to be wise that's why we need to be fully informed about God's word because it is the truth amen the Bible is the truth are you spending time reading the word of truth do, do you spend time meditating and reflecting on it because it will change your life second Timothy 2 and verse 15 says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a work where does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In an age where there's so much propaganda and, and so much fake news and so much lies that are being you know, put out there, we need to be in the word of God. We need to be informed about the word of God. Why? Because it is the truth. Truth I will live for and if necessary, die for. Philippians 1.21 for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. You cannot win in spiritual warfare as long as you're ignorant of God's word. Because the word of God, if properly preached, will comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. John Stott, we must allow the word of God to confront us, to disturb our security, to undermine our complacency, and to overthrow our patterns of thought and behavior. Are you allowing the word of God to work on you? Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, the Bible is soul food. This explains why some of you are so empty. Have you allowed the word of God to work in your heart and your home and your life? Are you walking in the light of God's word? The entrance of your words gives light, Psalm 119 verse 30 says. It gives understanding to the simple. You see, the Bible is our weapon, not against people. I don't believe in Bible bashing as people so call it. People aren't our problem. They're not our enemy. But rather, it's our weapon against the demons and devils and lies and strategies of Satan that deceive, consume, confuse, and destroy people. You see, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When we feed our faith, we starve our doubts. So I encourage you today as I finish, as the worship group come forward, feed your faith by reading your Bible. You know, R.C. Spohl said this, it's fashionable in some academic circles to exercise scholarly criticism of the Bible. In so doing, scholars place themselves above the Bible and seek to correct it. If indeed the Bible is the word of God, nothing could be more arrogant. It is God who corrects us. We don't correct him. We do not stand over God, but under him. You see, ultimately the battle is for the souls of men, the souls of women. That's why I'm not going to back down because there is no neutrality in this war. There are no demilitarized zones. 
You know, Paul, the apostle said in Acts chapter 26, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. And so I said, who are you, Lord? Acts 26. He said, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. But rise and stand to your feet. For I've appeared to you for this purpose. For what? To make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I'll reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. To do what? To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive from forgiveness of sins and inheritance among all those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. This is what God called Paul to do. This is what God called the apostles to do. And this is what the Lord has called every preacher down through the ages and ultimately every believer. It's not just the fact that a person doesn't, uh, does or doesn't believe in, in, in Jesus Christ. The Bible here addresses things in a spiritual manner and, and, and very clearly pulls aside the curtains and, 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 and talks about how there is a kingdom of light and a kingdom of darkness and how people are either under the power of God or the power of Satan. They may be cultured, they may be educated, they may be good moral people who do lots of good things. And God loves them. But the reality is, if you don't know Christ... If you haven't come into the light, you're still in the darkness. If you could stand to your feet today. Paul said I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. And I just want to give you an opportunity today. I don't know where you've been or what you've done, but this is the reality. Right now, right now, just as you are, heaven or hell awaits you. There is no third option. The Lord loves you. And I've done my best to preach, preach the gospel as clearly as I can. And it may have challenged you, may have shaken you, may have disturbed you. But it should. If you're not ready to stand before the Lord, you should be disturbed. You shouldn't get a night's sleep until you're right with God. Because you have an eternal soul. And Christ hung and bled and suffered and died to purchase your soul from hell. And what a tragedy it would be for you to die and go to hell because you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can be saved today. No matter where you've been or what you have done. I was just watching last night a testimony of a man from ISIS who had done terrible things and the Lord appeared to him. And the Lord said... I forgive you. And, and, he, and he was so taken by, by what the Lord was saying to him. Because he said, you know, in Islam, you, you don't know if you're going to find forgiveness until you stand before God after death. But this man was saying, you can be forgiven now. And he said, who are you? And he said, my, I am Jesus. And this, this young man who had done terrible atrocities and evil things, he called on Jesus right there and then. And he became a believer. Isn't that a beautiful thing? See, the Bible says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't changed. He is still a God of mercy. He is still mighty to save. And so I want you to be honest with yourself right now. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, if you've never surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to put your hand up if you would like to be saved today. You would like to surrender your life to Jesus. Is there anybody here today? Just be bold and put your hand up. If you would like to surrender your life to Jesus, I see that hand. God bless you. Is there anybody else here today? Don't resist the Holy Spirit. The Lord is moving in this place. The Word of God has gone forth, but you must respond and say yes. 
So if you've never said yes to Jesus, this is your moment. Don't miss your moment. Ushers, help me out. If there's anybody else here today, and you know you're not right with God, but today you would like to ask Jesus Christ into your heart. Today you would like to be saved. This is your moment to respond and say yes to Jesus.